access to information is vital. When you create a haystack of human lives, a bucket that collects all of the records of all of your private activities, our current epidemic of misinformation, we're getting these news deserts. Local news is going extinct. And we find this <laughs> negative relationship between voter turnout and exposure to fake news. The point of modern propaganda isn't only to misinform or push an agenda, it's to exhaust your critical thinking. And that's the way to annihilate truth. When you believe that something's wrong, what do you do? You get the future that you work for and you plan for. You get the future that you fight for. The most important thing we can do is hopefully arm the consumer. We need to keep studying these markets to really predict the implications for social welfare. If we don't have privacy, we don't have the sanctity of our own mind. I have the faith that we can, in fact, tackle these problems. Welcome, everybody. Whoa, this is a packed house. This is very exciting. Who's excited? Yeah, right on. So good evening, everyone. I'm Janet Weber. I'm the executive director of SFU Public Square. And I am so pleased that you are all here to join us for this sold out debate tonight. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are gathered here on the unceded lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. And let's all take a moment to think about how privileged we are to be able to be here on their lands tonight and think about in the future, what can we be doing to be supporting indigenous self-determination in this country? So really quickly, for those of you that don't know, SFU Public Square is a community engagement program of Simon Fraser University. We work to build social infrastructure, encourage civic participation, support knowledge exchange, and co-created solutions on our pressing social issues, one of which we're really diving into tonight. This event is part of our 2019 community summit called Confronting the Disinformation Age. The summit is, uh, has about 12 or 13 events, uh, started a couple, uh, yesterday and running through to the 18th, with each one of these events considering um, the pollution of our information ecosystem and how that's impacting society and also encouraging us to really think about solutions to confront this, these issues. So each event is meant to explore both the complexity and the consequences. So I wanna thank SFU's School of Public Policy, uh, the BC Civil Discourse Society, who you're gonna hear from shortly, and CBC Vancouver for their support tonight and also acknowledge our summit sponsors who are the City of Vancouver, Microsoft, and the Jaroslawski Foundation. We have two goals for tonight. One is to pro provide you with quality information and another is to model civil discourse. We want to show by example tonight through our debaters that it is possible to have a discussion and that people can disagree with each other and not result to personal attacks and insults. So we're hoping the team is going to stay clean tonight and no, no low punches. Um, and also I hope you all ha appreciate that we did we did lo-fi voting tonight. No one has to. No one had to get onto an, an app or anything like that. Everything is lo-fi. You voted with a piece of paper. Good. Uh, you also have uh, question cards. You're going to vote again, and Stephen Quinn's going to tell you when. And you also have question cards. So there's a lot of you. We can't take all of your questions, but uh, we're going to get you to write your cards again, super lo-fi on a piece of paper. We're going to read them. Then we're going to give them to Stephen. Unbelievable. Uh, so now I'd like to introduce Micah Goldberg, my partner in crime here, who's going to tell you a little bit about, uh, about him and about uh, the BC Civil Discourse Society. A lot, of, a lot of cheering for paper. That's a good start. On behalf of my society, the British Columbia Civil Discourse Society, I want to welcome everyone in the room tonight to what promises to be a highly informative and fascinating evening. My name is Micah Goldberg, and uh, along with those of you in the audience, I also want to welcome those of you who are watching by live stream and those of you who are listening and watching to this debate in the future. Hello. This is the, uh, the second time that Public Square and uh, my organization, the CDS, have teamed up to organize an Oxford-style debate. And I want to thank them, and particularly um, its fantastic executive director, Janet Weber, for believing in the merits of the adversarial process as a mechanism to harbor constructive, meaningful, and productive disagreement in the Public Square. And also, and perhaps more importantly, for scheduling this debate in a way that does not conflict with the Winnipeg Jets playoff schedule. 
this debate will, I strongly believe, serve as a showcase for the virtues of civil discourse. Often it can seem uh, the arenas for public discourse are consumed by deconstructive, malicious, outrage debates that do little to advance our collective understanding. And I believe there is a vacuum waiting to be filled by thoughtful, respectful, respectful and yes, passionate debate. And tonight we are going to debate a topic that is of paramount importance that evokes a lot of passion, whether social media undermines the very institutions that it claims to serve. And we are going to have that debate with four supremely qualified debaters who are honest and have integrity, hopefully. Um, and they will also quite possibly provide you with a little candor and good humor. So let me use this opportunity, in addition to what Janet has already said, to uh, put down a bit of a challenge. The mission of the CDS is to promote aggressively collegial disagreement in the public square. So here is the challenge. As we head into a federal election later this year and watch politicians and pundits turn ugly and petty, do not let the political currents upset the course of your own political discussions. Harness the momentum of this exercise tonight and learn from perspectives that may differ from your own. Listen to your interlocutors and improve the state of discourse in the public square. With that challenge in mind, let's get on with it, shall we? It is my honor to introduce you to our moderator tonight. He is the host of CBC's early edition after moving on from On the Coast. He is one of our city's most trusted journalists and respected citizens. Stephen Quinn is the host of tonight's debate where the motion is, is social media destroying democracy? Thank you so much for that completely fictional introduction. <laughs> Appreciate that. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I was hoping for a full house, and we got that this evening. I'm absolutely thrilled. Just uh, uh, looking forward to this so much. Um, and uh, thank you, Janet, as well. Uh, before we begin, I'd just like to give you a little bit of context for the debate this evening. Nearly half of the global population has access to the internet, and over the past decade, uh, social media has become a routine part of most of our daily lives. Uh, Facebook alone has more than 1.5 billion users every single day. Um, social media has, of course, changed the way we communicate with each other. It's changed the way we interact uh, with people, with our families, with our friends, uh, with our neighbors, uh, elected officials, corporations with which we may be unhappy, um, even complete strangers. Lots of hookups. Uh, it's, changed how we, it's changed how we access information uh, and where we get our information from. And uh, it's enabled uh, content production uh, rather than just consumption. Uh, we can have an argument about whether everyone has some kind of equal voice on social media. I'm sure that'll be part of this. Uh, un undoubtedly, all of this has had some effect on our democratic process. Is it, though, destroying democracy? That's a high bar. This isn't about whether it's good or bad for democracy, but the resolution is, is it destroying democracy? That is what we are here to debate tonight. And in the lead up to our federal election later this year, uh, we have to consider the potential impacts of social media on Canadians, uh, on the way we act and think, and especially on the way we vote, and on the information uh, with which we base our votes upon. Um, that is an impact on the democratic process, I would argue. Uh, and so our debaters with us tonight are going to help us answer that question. I will welcome all of our debaters to the stage right now and introduce them once they have comfortably been seated. <laughs> Beginning on my left, uh, arguing for the motion is Colin Bennett. Now, since 1986, Colin has taught in the Department of Political Science at the University of Victoria. 
His research has focused on the social implications of new information technologies. He has completed policy reports on privacy and data protection for various governments and commissions, and he is currently studying the use of personal data by political parties and election campaigns. Please welcome Colin Bennett. Ooh. Alongside Colin is David Mosscrop who is a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Communications at the University of Ottawa, a contributing columnist at the Washington Post, a writer with Maclean's Magazine, and the author, very recently, of a book called Too Dumb for Democracy, Why We Make Bad Political Decisions and How We Can Make Better Ones. It's a really good book. You should run out and buy it. Um, uh, Dave completed his PhD in political science at UBC and held a postdoc in the scholarly communication lab at Simon Fraser University. Please welcome David Mosscrop. <laughs> I didn't know you were selling books here this evening, David. So he'll sign that for you. <laughs> and now for the other side, arguing against the motion, social media is social media destroying our democracy, is Nazma Ahmed. Now, Nazma is the director of the Digital Justice Lab in Toronto, uh, whose mission it is to build toward a more just and equitable digital future. She has extensive experience working alongside the public service and the nonprofit sector, uh, focusing on technology capacity building. She was the 27-2018 Open Web Fellow with Mozilla and the Ford Foundation, and through her fellowship, she worked on building organizational digital security and running a youth workshop uh, series called Digital Future of Privacy. Please welcome Nasma. And debating alongside Nasma against the motion is Francesca Fionda. Francesca is a data journalist with The Discourse. That's a community-driven journalism organization based here in Vancouver. Uh, before The Discourse, she worked on investigative teams at Global News and at the CBC. Uh, three things she loves about democracy are freedom of opinion, freedom of expression, and the free stickers they give you on election day. So uh, please welcome Francesca. Now, tonight, our two teams of debaters will argue for and against the resolution, let it be resolved that social media is destroying democracy. Now, our debate will take place in three rounds, and before you, the audience, and you will vote to choose the winner. Now, round one will begin with a six-minute opening statement from each debater in turn. Round two involves debaters going back and forth, answering questions from you, but engaging among themselves as well. Round three has each debater giving a two-minute closing statement, and then it will be your turn to choose the winner. And as you checked in tonight, you should have received two ballots, one to cast before the event and one to cast at the end. And as you were taking your seats, you should have cast your first ballot. Has everyone cast their first ballot? Yes, good, lots of nods. Um, if you haven't, uh, just completely tear your, your selection and pass your vote to the nearest aisle. Uh, one of our volunteers will be standing by, happy to take that from you, collecting any last minute votes. If you did not receive a ballot or if you misplaced your ballot, please raise your hand and a volunteer will get you a new one. Please vote only once. Um, and then after we hear from the debaters, you will be voting again with your second ballot because we're polling you on your opinion both before and after the debate to see which side has changed the minds of most of our audience members. And the side that changes the most minds will win the debate. And if all goes well, it will be a victory for civil discourse as well. <laughs> now, without further ado, let's get started with round one. And round one, as I said, begins with opening statements by each debater in turn. Speaking first for the resolution, social media is destroying democracy, is David Mosscrop. David. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, uh, colleagues and comrades. I um, am very pleased to be here tonight to try to convince you that social media is destroying democracy. Now, the easiest way to do that would be to show you my Twitter mentions. <laughs> and then we could just call it a night and go get a drink. But that wouldn't be very sporting, and so I'm going to argue the case on its merits, starting with this. 
So what's democracy? Uh, I'm a democratic theorist by, by training, and I ask a few questions when I'm trying to evaluate that question. One is, do you have free, fair, regular elections? That's a pretty low bar. Check. Do you have representative policies? Do people get the sort of policies that they want from their government? Mm, Check-ish. Do we have routine and meaningful political participation by ordinary citizens? Check minus. And do we make good political decisions on the regular? Not so check. What's a good political decision? A good political decision is rational and autonomous. It's based on uh, information that you collect about the world that's accurate, that's true, that's verifiable, that you can understand and share with someone else. And it's based on reasons, reasons that you can come up with yourself, defend yourself, and share with other people who can recognize them as reasons. That's a good political decision. It's actually very, very hard to do in the best of environments. In fact, we're no better at making a good political decision by nature than we are at hitting a fastball. And if you ever tried to hit a fastball or score a goal, for instance, uh, as part of the Winnipeg Jets hockey club, you know that it's very, very hard to do. And so it, it, good political decision making is difficult under the best of circumstances, and now we are facing uh, the worst of circumstances. And therefore, social media is destroying democracy. Now, how? Well, off the top of my head and looking at my notes, uh, social media undermines our elections, we have learned. It um, pushes back against our desire for representative policies. It undermines political participation and it undermines good political decisions. So if you evaluate the things that make a good democracy, you, you f uh, figure out very, very quickly that social media undermines all of those things. Hard to do in the first place, much harder to do in the era of social democracy, uh, uh, sorry, of um, digital media and social democracy. Now, when we get into the nitty gritty, into the deep um, specific facts of, of how this happens, what the operation is, we find out that our brains aren't particularly well adapted to the social media environment. It's not our fault. We've evolved for a very, very different time. Social media is asking us to do things that we're just not naturally equipped to do particularly well. And one of the biggest culprits of, of the undermining of democracy by social media is the, the sheer volume and speed of information. It overwhelms us, it stresses us, it creates anxieties. In his uh, book, The Organized Mind, Dan Levitin, I'm gonna be a heretic and plug somebody else's book. It's also quite good. It found out that in 1986, um, Americans consumed a certain amount of information. By 2011, it was five times more. That was 2011. Imagine how much more it is today. At the time, that was 34 gigabytes of information a day that went through your head, uh, 100,000 words. As a planet, in 2011, we had created um, 300 exabytes of information. That's a three followed by 20 zeros. The brain processes about, about 120 bits per second. It's not so much. So the speed and the volume of information that's coming at us is too much. It overwhelms us. It exhausts us. So it shouldn't surprise you to learn that when we look at social media and what it does in the democratic space, we find what? Let me just realist. Surveillance corporate oligopoly, which Colin will get into, uh, polarization, filter bubbles, it platforms and recruits extremists at home and abroad, uh, misinformation, disinformation, fragmented media, micro-targeting, foreign interference in our politics and elections, Trump and Brexit, for instance, hacked accounts, sock puppets, astroturf, and uh, groups, and of course, garden variety trolls. Now, that is what the social media landscape looks like. And in fact, we learned the other day from the Communication Security Establishment, uh, Canada's cyber watchdog, um, that the 2019 election will absolutely be targeted uh, for foreign interference. There's no doubt about it. The only question is whether or not we can withstand it. We also learned that political parties have already been targeted, political parties being probably the weakest chain in the information link in our politics. They've got your data, they aren't subject to, to privacy regulations, and they are easy targets. Uh, so. That's a problem as well. Now, I don't think social media is inherently bad, despite all of that. It could serve democracy. It, we could imagine a world in which it wasn't destroying democracy. But social media has, on balance, contributed to democratic decline. And it's become a power, a weapon of the strong, another arrow in the quiver 
of those who have already so many very arrows so that they can control the democratic space in ways that's deleterious to public participation, free and fair elections, good political decision making and representative policies. And therefore, social media is regrettably, but um, undeniably, destroying democracy. Thank you. David Moscroft, thank you. Uh, Francesca will now give her opening statement against the resolution. Nesma and I want to thank all of you for coming here tonight and listening to our arguments. And while neither of us have PhDs, we've done a lot of Googling and a lot of YouTubing thanks to the fact <laughs> that social media has democratized information. To us, a democracy is more than voting. It's more than having free and fair elections. A healthy democracy means citizens are free to express themselves, free to have opinions, free to come together in groups, and free to read news that isn't controlled by the government. I'm gonna guess how most of us here in this room today use social media is one of the main ways that we participate in our democracy. Social media helps us express the fundamental democratic freedoms that we've outlined in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. In particular, freedom of expression, freedom of opinion, freedom of the press, and freedom of assembly. Take freedom of expression and freedom of opinion, for example. Social media is a tool that has allowed many of us here in this room to express ourselves, our emotions, our beliefs, and I mean more than the I'm feeling hungry option in your status feeds. You can share opinions on important policies that shape the world around you and start a discussion. You can agree, you can disagree, for example, I'll share a tweet from David Moskrop on the foreside. Just this week, he tweeted in response to the Minister of Democratic Institution, Karina Gold's comments, that she hasn't seen much progress from social media companies to ensure that the 2019 election is free from foreign, foreign interference and misinformation. At David underscore Moskrop, since uh, you want to follow him, tweeted in response, you're the government, if you're worried that the election could be compromised and social media companies aren't doing their fair share to protect the country against that, then you can regulate them. If you can't, that's a bigger problem and we need to have a serious chat. Let's take a look at freedom of the press. Social media is a tool that's allowed the press to publish freely and for readers to have access to many different news sources. If you're worried about misinformation, Trust in news on social media is only at 21%, according to Reuters Digital News Report. People are rightfully questioning their sources. And if you're worried about echo chambers, when people only get information that supports their own views, it might comfort you to know that Canadians get their news from all sorts of places. Yes, 48% of Canadians get their news from social media, but 31% actually get their news from print, and 67% from television. So people are getting information from a diverse range of sources. Finally, looking at freedom of assembly. How did you hear about the Me Too rallies? How did you learn about Black Lives Matter? How did the hereditary chiefs of the Wet'suwet'en people get word out that RCMP were entering their land? Social media. They use social media because women and people of color have too often been ignored, and in a democracy, you're allowed to stand up and say, that isn't okay. A democracy also means that you won't always like the results. That's democracy's fault, not social media. We've seen people blame social media for recent democratic decisions, like Brexit, Trump, and Bodie McBoatface. <laughs> but these were all democratic decisions. They just might not have been the best democratic tool for the job. There are lots of different ways that a democracy can function. Brexit was decided by a referendum. Referendums have been criticized for being particularly undemocratic. They polarize people into strict yes or no camps. They dump important policy decisions to the public, leaving elected officials without responsibility. I could go on, but we're not here to talk about why democracy itself needs improvement. Trump was elected in an American democracy, which has two dominant parties, another democratic system that is set up to be very polarizing. And finally, Bodie McBoatface, was an online poll in March 2016 put out by the British Natural Environment Research Council to name one of their boats. A radio host suggested Bodie McBoatface, and the joke caught on. Bodie McBoatface was the popular vote. In the end, though, 
they decided to call it the Sir David Attenborough. <laughs> because in the end, they decided that an online poll might not have been the best democratic system for naming a boat. <laughs> Although I, I disagree. So in closing, a reminder that we are what make up a democracy. People, it's all of us, social media users, to decide how to use social media. So today, vote for yourselves and the power that we have in this democracy, and vote for our side. Thank you, Francesca. I didn't see that coming, the Bodie McBoke face. <laughs> That'll be, exactly. Isn't one of the launches now named Bodie McBoat face? There's a... Or something. The submarine. Uh, thank you, the ROV. Thank you. Phil Newton in the audience with us this evening. <laughs> uh, and now, Colin Bennett. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I, when he uh, told you uh, how long I'd been at UVic, that really makes me feel like the old guy on this panel, I must say. Um, I don't even have a Facebook account. Never have, never will. Um, I got a Twitter account. Easily, thank you, thank you. How many people do not have a Facebook account here? Okay, wow. You're going to be voting for our side, right? Yeah. Um, I, I do have a Twitter account with measly a thousand followers, nothing like my mic. Uh, I've got a very boring website, and yes, I've got a PhD, sorry. Um, of course, I don't have a Facebook account, but I am on Facebook, right? I am on Facebook. I'm all over it. Through posts of friends, family, colleagues, news organizations, students, groups. Yes, I'm on Facebook, without my knowledge and my consent. Much of it would be public information, but some probably more private. Somebody made comments, posts, etc. Yeah, I'm on Facebook, even though I don't want to be. Um, the motion, just a, just a literal notion of the social media is destroying democracy. It doesn't say social media has destroyed democracy. Just make that distinction when you vote, right? All I'm arguing, I think all the way I'm arguing, there's a trend going on here, and it's not, it's in a negative direction. I don't want to argue that social media does not play a role in connecting people. I'm sure it does. I'm sure it's a very efficient way to connect people, to organize, to link. And I'm sure we can think of many examples in those, including those represented by our opponents on the other side, which have promoted social connection and engagement. I also don't want to contend that social media may not be more democratic in the future. But my point is that the way that the prominent social media platform companies, and particularly Facebook, are currently operating and financed is inherently anti-democratic. Because the business model of the large social media platforms relies on the intensive, widespread, and enduring surveillance of its users. Social networking companies engineer a universe of tremendously compelling and addictive services that hold the user's attention. They collect as much data on the individual user as possible through those digital services, all to the end of constructing comprehensive behavioral tracking profiles on each and every one of us. And they develop and they deploy algorithms designed to predict which content will keep us scrolling, watching, and clicking. And they target the ads interspersed throughout that content that we're likely to click on for their optimum revenue. It's surveillance, plain and simple. The non-transparent, non-consensual capture and processing of user-generated data in violation of the commonly accepted privacy norm that organizations should not be tracking us without our knowledge or consent, unless there are legitimate reasons to do so in the public interest. And they do that at the same time as telling us that your privacy is important to us. No, it isn't. If it were, Facebook and Google would not spend millions of dollars lobbying against privacy laws around the world. If it were, those terms of service would be comprehensible and clear, and people might read them and know what they were consenting to. If social networking companies only captured personal information with the knowledge and consent of its users, they would be out of business. They wouldn't be able to attract advertisers. Well, companies like Facebook will say one thing to users, it will say exactly the opposite to the advertisers on whom it relies for revenue 
a massive profit. And let's put to bed straight away the argument that people do not care about their privacy, or the argument that young people do not care about their privacy. Yes, they do. Before anybody quotes Mark Zuckerberg that our privacy norms are changing, no, they are not. Research has shown that overall there are, in fact, very few statistically significant generational differences about privacy. Young people do care about their privacy, just in different ways. They care about it in relation to their parents, their teachers, institutional actors, if not so much in relation to their friends. It's highly contextual and it's important to all of us. So why is privacy essential for democracy? What's the connection? We need privacy for all kinds of different reasons, psychological, political, economic. It helps us be and become healthy human beings. We all need to withdraw from social life and we each find mechanisms to do that. It serves a political purpose because it keeps large organizations, public and private, accountable. Privacy rules are just one mechanism used in democratic societies to restore the balance between the individual and the powerful organization. And privacy helps us receive the benefits and services that are due to us. It promotes trust in government agencies and in our corporations, or at least it should do. So in conclusion, so long as say, surveillance capitalism, to quote a book by, uh, the recent book by a woman called Shoshana Zuboff, is the business model of the internet and of the big social media platforms, it will reinforce anti-democratic and anti-privacy forces. Surveillance capitalism, a global architecture of behavior modification where predictions about our behavior are bought and sold. It's not big brother, she calls it big other. Extreme concentrations of power Power, free from democratic oversight. That's what social media has become. That's the economics of social media. That's the business model behind it. It's a tool for surveillance capitalism. It's a business model that cannot be sustained if democracy is to flourish and thrive. Thank you. Colin Bennett, thank you. And now Nazma Ahmed will give her opening statement against. Hello, everybody. I often struggle with my definition of democracy. Uh, what does it mean to be a part of a democratic state, especially when I do not see myself in its prosperity? A nation state that has continued to ignore the atrocities experienced by indigenous peoples, that continues to mistreat migrants, and the ongoing list of inequities that exist on this land. It is easy for us to pose social media as the culprit, right? The culprit that's destroying our democracy. Uh, as the core thing that we believe, in, we believe in our democracy and that social media can do all of that. Um, it's an easy target with all the information that we're getting every single day, the over, just absolute overload of news, uh, having to follow your boss even if you don't want to, or you know, getting trolled as often as you might. Um, with the silo chambers that we're in, uh, the confusing ads uh, that exist on these platforms. So it's hard and it's easy to blame social media for the issues that we currently have today. We still don't know how all of it works. Uh, researchers haven't gotten complete access to the algorithms that help shape the platforms that we use every day. Everything seems so unknown to us um, and it's scary. And that's the hard part of all of this work because who wants the data lords to take over, right? Social media isn't destroying democracy. It may be threatening it, showing the true colors, unveiling the mask, so to speak, but definitely not destroying, because democracy is always in a state of crisis. And it's important to recognize that social media is a tool right? One of the tools in the toolbox. Um, we have seen propaganda, obviously, over the course of history, and social media currently is one of the tools that is being used to spread misinformation. And as I was going down a, a little bit of a research rabbit hole, uh, thanks to Google.com and other platforms, um, I, you know, 
was really trying to figure out my understanding of the, the role of propaganda, right? And the ways in which it spreads, obviously, through social media. But before that, actually, we've had many other great examples of propaganda prior to social media. Um, the fight in Saskatchewan uh, by Tommy Douglas for Medicare, right? $115,000 was spent against uh, the fight for Medicare in the 1960s, right? And that was, that was posters, uh, that was uh, radio campaigns, that was the works in the 1960s. 1960s. And even a more recent example in Ontario, when we're doing the sex education curriculum, uh, communities actually created pamphlets because folks were not um, all online. Um, and pamphlets actually speaking against the sex education curriculum uh, using wrong facts, right? And so we know this stuff happens. And social media is one of those tools uh, that definitely helps spread it, but is not the cause of it. And so I think it's important to note that social media is not destroying democracy, wealth, and power is destroying democracy. And unfortunately, it's pretty easy to use social media as a cop-out, right? And I'm saying this as someone who works in technology. I work in technology all the time. I have to talk about big data all the time. And all and every single time, we always end up getting into a core conversation of power, right? Who holds power? Right? Who holds the wealth? Um, and a good example of that, especially with the rise of the concentration of wealth here in Canada, especially with the 1%, um, there was a more recent book, uh, The Age of Increasing Inequality and the Astonishing Rise of Canada's 1%. And they shared that the top 1% um, actually has more than doubled. Right, um, and the income growth is actually even stronger for the top one percent. I think that is that is one of the core issues when we're thinking about the destruction of democracy and how we connect with our communities, how we're able to participate um, in representation, representational policy, especially when we don't necessarily always have the power to do so. And I find that in many cases we use social media as a way of avoiding the problem. Right? Who wants to talk about racism when you can just say social media is doing it all, right? Trump was not elect, like the reason why Trump was not elected, right, is not because all of a sudden people became racists. Not at all. I wish that was the case. You know, I wish it was a, we were able to transform everyone all, all at once. Um, that was not the case at all, right? It was small nudges, definitely. And so I think it's important to know that social media is threatening democracy, but it is not destroying democracy, and we're constantly finding ways of avoiding the real conversations of the systematic inequalities that we experience, right? Our anger is not necessarily on the platforms, definitely on the companies, I understand that for sure, right? The reason why we have these massive tech monopolies that exist is partly because of the lack of regulation, so that's one piece of the puzzle, and also that they have been able to scapegoat uh, taxation. There's a lot of other conversations that are actually not necessarily about the platform itself, but the ways in which these companies operate in the ecosystem. And so as we move forward, I want us to constantly think of why do we keep blaming social media for these for these issues when there are a lot larger societal issues that we're dealing with here. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Nasma. Uh, now, I would like to update you with the results of the preliminary vote. This is how you stood when you walked in the door tonight. Uh, once again, our resolution is as follows. Let it be resolved that social media is destroying democracy. Uh, based on the votes cast as each of you entered the room, uh, for the resolution, 50%. Oh. Against the resolution, 20%. And 30% undecided, yes. which is interesting. So <laughs> sway everyone. <laughs> um, and again, the winner of tonight's debate is the team that is going to, who sways the most voters. So we're looking at the difference <clears throat> between the two votes here. Uh, now we move on to round two. And in round one, the debaters, uh, in, in round two rather, the debaters address each other directly. Uh, they'll take questions from uh, me as well. They'll take your questions as well. Um, as you register tonight, you should have received a pen and a card to write your question on. In about 10 minutes' time, we're going to begin collecting uh, your questions. 
And uh, so please start thinking about writing down what you would like to ask the debaters. Uh, we'll flash a prompt on the screen to, to pass your question cards down the road to the nearest aisle. Uh, and please hang on to them until then. We'll only be collecting the cards once. So if you would like your question to be considered, uh, be sure to get it down the aisle when the prompt comes. Everybody got that? So fill out your question cards now. Um, and while you do that, I will attempt to summarize some of what we just heard um, from the opening statements for the four side, or from the four side, uh, we heard that prominent social media platform companies, particularly Facebook, uh, are currently operating uh, and, finan uh, and finance, the way they're operating and financed is in inherently undemocratic, uh, that the business model of large social media companies relies on uh, the intensive gathering of information, uh, tracking people who uh, do not consent, uh, surveilling its users, um, the public bads, we've heard about polarization, filter bubbles, platforms, uh, we've heard about recruiting extremists, uh, micro-targeting and foreign interference in uh, our upcoming election and others. Uh, from the against side, we heard that social media help us, helps us express uh, some of the fundamental democratic freedoms that are outlined in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Uh, we hear that there is a greater distribution of ideas. Um, and uh, that you can threaten the system of government no matter what kind of government we're talking about. Um, and democracy, we have heard, uh, means that you will not always like the results. Uh, that's not the fault of social media. Uh, that is the fault of democracy. Uh, so that's a little bit of what we've heard so far. Um, I'll give uh, each of you an opportunity to engage anyone else on the panel at this stage if you would like, uh, but I will begin with a question. Um, and we talked about echo chambers a moment ago, and David, I'll direct this to you because this was one of your criticisms, that um, people opposed to social media uh, often point to echo chambers uh, where you filter out opinions that may be uncomfortable and, and keep only the uh, opinions that, that tend to support your own. Um, do you think that people's views are actually being manipulated on social media if we all live in an echo chamber? Yes, well, first of all, the echo chamber question is uh, critical to our understanding what the social media space looks like. Mm -hmm. Now, the good news is uh, echo chambers and filter bubbles aren't as bad as you might think that they are. They're not as pervasive as, as you believe. They happen, but they're not um, totalitarian. So that's good news. It isn't like we are a handful of solitudes that never meet. We do meet, and when we meet, it's awful. So filter bubbles and uh, are part of the problem. The problem is you think, well, good, there are no filter bubbles. Then you realize that, oh, God, there are no filter bubbles. And what you find is that when the, the quality of online discourse is so low on balance, and it even is it's able to, in fact, uh, cloud out the good stuff to the point where it becomes almost impossible to have a good conversation in social media space because um, either you get bad faith actors who dominate or you get good faith actors who get dominated by bad faith actors. And what the bad faith actors are doing is manipulating people by agenda setting and by poisoning the tone of online discourse. A recent study by uh, CBC of five million tweets uh, released by Twitter a few years ago found that going back to 2013, foreign forces um, from Venezuela, Syria, Russia and elsewhere had been poisoning Canadian discourse around immigration, uh, pipelines, and other sensitive topics. Their goal wasn't to convince anyone. It was to rile people up, to make sure that the tone of discourse was toxic, and to manipulate them into attacking one another or getting exhausted and tuning out altogether. So what we find is the frying pan's on fire. And when we're able to leap out of it, we leap into a bonfire. And we're on fire the whole time, and the kitchen's on fire, and the living room's on fire, the house is on fire, the apartment block is on fire, the country's on fire, the world's on fire, and social media is a giant um, uh, tank of gasoline. Not to overstate the case. <laughs> Thank you, David. Uh, Nasma or Francesca, uh, since you are on the uh, against side, would you like to take a crack at that or respond? 
Yeah, I think um, definitely the comments section can be a nasty place. It can be toxic. Um, but when you look at the idea of how much more information is available, I think what needs to happen is that people uh, need to be educated on, on where to go and how to challenge their own beliefs. It's not that that information isn't out there. It's that we haven't learned how to go beyond our own spaces and, and look for that information. So um, I think we have some catching up to do, but I, I don't think it's destroying. And the, the, the other point that I wanted to make was um, I, I, I've, I've been surprised by uh, the comments section a few times uh, where I work. We have uh, a bit of a policy to be generous with our assumption in the uh, generous with our assumptions in the in the comments section. And uh, a few times I've caught myself reading a comment where the tone in my inside voice when I read it, I think, oh no, there's no way that I can engage with this person. But um, when you are generous with your assumptions, you get in there and you find out that a lot of people are, are just trying to have a discussion mm -hmm. and learn. And um, when we go into these spaces with more of an open mind, I think that we would be a lot more surprised. Hmm. Uh, Nazma, I want to ask a question about something you brought up, which is uh, the trouble with democracy. One of the problems with democracy is the, uh, the inequity, the inequality that we all uh, live with uh, in a place like Canada. Does social media uh, make people more equal, or does it uh, highlight the rift? I don't... I don't think it's make, make people more equal. I think it creates um, a space for people to have discourse. It creates a space for people to share um, their stories. And I think that's what we're seeing with, for example, indigenous folks talking about the pipelines. That's one example. There's a lot of issues out of you know, Montreal, um, Halifax, you know, in different reservations that I would never have known about if they weren't posted on social media. And so I do believe that it does create a space where for example, traditional media outlets would not have you like you know highlighted a story, but there are activists, there are <laughs> residents who are keeping a watch of what's happening, right? And being able to highlight that, um, you know, and I, so I think that that has created an environment where we're almost on the pulse of all the things that are happening at all times, which is obviously terrifying, um, I, in, at all times terrifying. But I, I think that's a reckoning that we have to experience, right? Um, Things that we might be, we might have been able to avoid, we can't avoid anymore. Um, and part of that is because if you don't see it on your Instagram story, you see it on Facebook newsfeed. If you don't see it on Facebook newsfeed, you'll see it on Twitter. And you know, for a while, I did. I used to feel frustrated by that, but I think that part of it is people are trying to share their stories and they're trying to get a support and social media plays a role in gathering that attention and we've seen this constantly where people would post on social media and then traditional news sources would come through, right? And so I think it's definitely creating a more democratic process in how you engage in discourse. Colin, uh, all of those additional voices contributing to the discussion, does that not enhance democracy? It, it's, it's contributing to information, you know, it's contributing to the volume of information that's out there. I, I don't know that it really contributes to deliberation, careful deliberation about our, uh, our future. I'll give you one example that's obviously current, Brexit. <clears throat> you know, uh, I, I'm old enough to remember the first referendum in Britain about whether or not the United Kingdom should be in the European Union, and it this was pre-internet, pre-social pre media, and the, the 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 quality of the debate at that time was just far more sophisticated, far more uh, 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 civil than you know it is at the moment when when social media is in the picture. Leave means leave. Well, there you go. You know, um, in 144 characters. You know, well, how can you how can you argue against that? But better in. Oh well, there you go. Um, no, no, pe people deliberated and there was democratic discourse and there was ways to get information before social media came along. In fact, I would say that, um, that it's actually better if people have to make an effort to find information, actually to go down to the news store and buy the newspaper and sit in the coffee shop. I, I know I'm sounding like an old fogey now, but, you know, the, the, you know the, there's something, I, I'm not persuaded by the, 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 the argument that somehow, simply because it's easy to get information, simply because it comes across your new feed, news feed just like that, that that is promoting democracy. I, I think that we as individuals have to make that effort to get that information, to digest it, and to deliberate about it as well.
And that goes back to David's point about the speed of the information the, yeah. and the, the volume of the information. Uh, Francesca, what about that? What about how much information there is out there and, and the speed that it's coming at us and just the, sh the sheer volume? Yeah, I think there's no arguing. There's, there's so much information out there. And, and to this point about effort, um, making an effort to, to get that information, it's a lot easier. But in fact, I, I think what we need to do is we need to... to um, rethink of what, what that effort means. And, and right now what that effort means is it's, it means that we need to equip people with, with ways to fact check, with ways to think critically about information and, and to look beyond the first thing that crosses your feed. Maybe you go to a source that you don't normally go to. Uh, Nazma, we also heard David talk about political interference in elections. Um, how can social media be good when we know that uh, foreign uh, powers, uh, uh, bad faith players, are interfering with uh, democratic elections uh, using social media as a tool. Um, I believe that it's part of the process, unfortunately, right? Um, what we're having right now of uh, foreign forces coming through is actually, for example, actually the Brexit one is a good one because it, what ended up happening was a manipulation of people's current ideologies, right? People who were already xenophobic, right? That was one thing, let's be honest. Some were. Uh, some of them, right? Xenophobic. Uh, there was also a huge class divide, right? In the conversation around Brexit that was then further manipulated, obviously, through social media, right? And, and kind of nudged, right? The nudging effect of pushing mm -hmm. people. Um, I, I do think with the foreign actor section of this work, um, and the interference, I think, once again, there's a greater need, obviously, for literacy. Um, but also, something to understand is, with this foreign interference, it is nudging on the current state of affairs, right? So within, with Trump, with the Trump election, it was, you know, racist Americans. Um, it was xenophobic Americans. It was, you know, working class, poor, um, also wealthy uh, women, white women as well. Um, so there's a whole crew of them. Uh, and so <laughs> it, was, it was all ranges, obviously. But it was, a, it was a slight nudging, right? But the fact that the nudging could occur Right, the fact that you could be persuaded um, very ever so slowly, right, with the same ideologies that you might have or things that you never wanted to share, um, you know, that you only have small group chats about, um, and you were slowly nudged, uh, I think is a bigger conversation beyond the social media platform, right, of what we actually value in society, how we exist in community with one another. Um, and also maybe the uncomfortabilities that we may have with the changing and diverse populations that exist, right? Or the fears that we have around the economy. Um, and these are all other conversations that were obviously nudged through foreign actors. And I think that's important to note, it was. Um, but these were issues prior to, right? Um, and foreign actors were able to see that that was clearly an issue and ride it, right? So a good example was um, Russian bots pretending to be uh, black activists, right? That was a huge issue in the U.S. elections. Um, but they were, they were really um, getting onto an issue that existed prior to um, and latched onto it. And so I think that's a bigger a societal conversation than the social media piece. I'd like to hear David respond to that because it's an interesting notion that simply those, those bad actors are, are just pushing people who are already almost there. I believe, uh, and the more I study social media and communication and the political psychology of decision making or the psychology of political decision making, <clears throat> that democracy is fragile inherently. The history of democracy is the history of us losing democracy. What we've done is introduced uh, social media, which is acting as a virus or an opportunistic infection, but the, the infection is going to kill us. Hence, social media destroying democracy. Now, when it comes to Russia, I, I like to joke that the Soviet Union has a very good long game. <clears throat> 1989, well, I guess that's the end of that. Shh, guys, just wait. <clears throat> the, the, the Russian campaign, um, it's also a Chinese campaign, it's also a campaign from other foreign states, to undermine Western democracy and the Western alliance has been turbocharged by social and digital media because it's now easier, faster, cheaper, 
and less risky than ever. And therefore, it is profoundly destructive towards democracy, and that's state actors. Does anyone want to guess what one of the top vectors of radicalization is right now around the world? Does anyone want to shout it out? I probably shouldn't say. It might be bad form to name. Twitter's one of them. YouTube. YouTube is the worst. And I don't need to name you the groups that are being radicalized or that are radicalizing folks on, on YouTube. I can just do this. Think of the worst possible gangs of thugs and murderers and terrorists that you can possibly imagine. It's them. They're recruiting. And they're getting very, very good at social media. Very good indeed. And so there's another vector of, of democratic destruction. is isn't just what it's doing to us, but what it's enabling foreign powers and non-state actors who want to undermine democracy to do as well. And it's working extremely well for them. And so, um, Francesca, does that lead to the discussion about more regulation? Do we need to have more regulation of social media platforms? Do they need to do a better job of policing themselves or does somebody need to police them from the outside? I think, um, yeah, I, I absolutely think that there needs to be regulation and just like any, just like any freedom that we have, it can infringe on other freedoms and, and there needs to be um, ways to, to protect people from hate speech and needs to be ways to protect people from misinformation. Um, and, I, and, I, and I think, um, as Colin alluded, like we're still learning about this technology. We're still trying to figure it out and part of that is figuring out a way to make sure that we can use this tool um, in, in ways that ensure that the information that we're sharing is accurate and, and it contributes to a fair and free discussion. Um, is it impossible to have, I'll throw this out to, to everybody on the panel as we continue to collect uh, your question cards, is it possible to have a civil discussion about politics on social media, Colin? Yeah, uh, yes, it's possible. Is it happening? No. <clears throat> um, I, I mean, yeah, yeah, no, if you, it, I mean, I, no, and I, I, I would concede that there's probably some very, you know, sort of small social media sites out there with a few thousand, you know, uh, members who are having a very, very civil discussion about, about, you know, local local issues and so on. I just don't see it happening on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a... Uh, uh, if we, if you know, it, it does come back, of course, to what we're what we're talking about with meaning democracy here. And democracy is not just about giving people choices. It's not just about elections. It's not just about, you know, which party we're going. to... It is about deliberation. It's about discussion. It's about open open discourse. And 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 what worries me, uh, and 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 David, David has, has alluded to this, is that um, we've 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 entered into this bargain. It's a devil's bargain with these companies, and we don't pay anything for it. The problem is it's free, right? <clears throat> the problem is it's free. We know we don't, you don't pay Facebook any money. You don't pay Twitter any money. And that's, we're paying for it with our personal data, with our personal information. So, for, so the flip side of whatever discussion and deliberation and engagement you can see on, on social media is that that data is being captured mm -hmm. in perpetuity and it might be used down the road by any actor uh, with evil or with good intent uh, in ways that those individuals don't know about. That's my central point here. It's not just, you don't just have to look at social media as if they're, as if it's, you know, you have to look at the structure of power that under, underlies it. I agree with what Nasma said earlier. That's what it's about, the structure of power and the economic model which drives it, which drives Facebook and the big social media companies. Uh, Nasma, is that not the fundamental flaw here, as Colin just said, that it is free, we make that deal with the devil, and we uh, surrender our, our information, and that information uh, is ultimately used to either uh, try to sway our opinions or market something else to us? Yes, but I think it's important to note um, that our democratic institution has actually allowed for these economic, develop economic models to exist, right? <laughs> That's important to also note, that yeah. Facebook is a behemoth, of course, and I will never argue against that, but Facebook is also a mechanism of the current democratic system that we exist in, mm -hmm. right? That will allow for a company to do something like that right, to exist as that monster that it is right now. Um, and it's also important to note that social media is not just Twitter, YouTube, um, Facebook, it's not just that, right? It's also the cesspool that is Reddit, 
uh, which is one. Um, but it's also <laughs> that, the that public... That help your case. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The cesspool that is Reddit that I also love Reddit, though. Um, but it is also the public forums, right? Um, I think one of the first examples of a social media platform was CompuServe actually had a public forum space, right? And that was in, 19, in the 1980s. And so I oh. think it's important... Yeah, yeah, you probably yeah have. no, that you made my point. Yes, but that was the 1980s. No, it that's 1980s, yeah. But I, I think it's important to note that even right now, there are also public forum spaces that sure. people use that aren't necessarily the Facebooks and the Twitters, right? And I think it's important for us to remove, when we're thinking about social media platforms, to constantly be thinking about the big behemoths. There are also many smaller social media platforms that are creating spaces for people to actually have civil discourse. There's also Facebook groups, for example. And Facebook groups have been a place and a home for a lot of people to parse through feelings, parse through housing issues, parse through, you know, if this thing is legal or not legal, you know, or like the cat meme, your favorite cat meme of the week, you know? And so I think that it's important to know that it has been a place for civil discourse. Is, is it always a place? No, not at all. And can foreign actors play a role? Can bad trolls play a role? Yes, of course. But we have to understand that this current system that we exist in right now has allowed for the behemoth of Facebook and the behemoth of Alphabet Company that owns a bajillion other companies. And David? I um, keep track of my, my hate mail. I, I keep all of it <clears throat> because I think it's funny. I once had an exchange with Ezra Levant. Mm. My fave. All right, the joke. All right, that joke tells itself. <laughs> he'll do this thing where he'll quote tweet you and then block you. Mm. I suspect, perhaps he knows what happens next. Uh, that was one week, and then the next week uh, I had a, a, a similar exchange with Jordan Peterson. It was a long couple of weekends. <clears throat> I'm going to open up. I have a Facebook album that I call the CBS. You know, anyone ever watch Letterman, the old Letterman show? Mm -hmm. I was a big fan of Let Letterman growing up. He had the CBS mailbag. I've got a thing called the CBS hate mailbag. Let's open up the old CBS hate mailbag. Why print media is failing because of people like David Moscrop. David Moscrop, this is the most pathetic, desperate piece of junk writing I've ever read in Canada. I hope you've accumulated hefty student loans until it will take your entire life to pay them back, hence this writing assignment. Wow. I, it's the ultimate. Anyone, this is my favorite. No, this is my favorite. Anyone can do years of research. <laughs> PhDs and profs are not special geniuses just because of research. That's the same one. I hope you die. What, what does this have to do with whether social the, well, media is I'm destroying saying, democracy? Those, those are just from my mom. I, every time you try to have a political conversation, especially if you have a profile, this is what it looks like. Uh, the space is so polluted that even good faith efforts end up looking like this. And mm -hmm. it's hard to ignore that. You, know, you end up doing the emotional and the physical labor of having to do the work for these companies of, of monitoring and curating and protecting their space because frankly they don't give a damn about you. Right. What they care about is money. And they know that it's destroying democracy. Uh, and they don't care of democracy. And if you look at how they, they play with non-democratic states like China, for instance, you, you realize very quickly that they care about one thing. And that's the bottom line. So, when, so we have established that social media is, is certainly harming democracy, I think destroying it, and that the, the tech companies aren't going to save us. But here's the, the utter heart of the problem. They're too big for governments to push back on now. They're too big to fail. They know no one's going to call them on their bullshit. And now we're stuck. So we're locked into this ecosystem that is dragging us down the whirlpool. Francesca? I, I, I mean, I think part of the discussion, and you mentioned this before, this is sheer volume of ideas. It's just that I, the greater distribution of ideas generally threatens most systems, no matter what kind of a system that is. And um, I was just looking back to, to different examples and, and a similar discussion to one that we were having here happened in the 1500s. Um, and that was, it was a technology, it was spreading information, crazy ideas like the sun was the center of the universe and uh, maybe the Catholic church shouldn't be in charge of everything. And that was the Gutenberg press with movable type. And that was because people in power were afraid of all these ideas that were spreading. And I think it's just about figuring out 
um, figuring, figuring out how we can sift through all that information and improving literacy of, of, of people as we go through a new way of digesting information. Yeah, and I tried to have a civil discourse once with Sue Ann Levy. And, you know, it worked on the phone <laughs> for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I must be doing something wrong because I never get feedback like that. <laughs> I'd love to have that. that, would, that would. <laughs> Try working for the CBC. Yeah. <laughs> Touche. Um, <laughs> the internet is one giant call-in show. Is, well, that, that, that is pretty much the case. Um, what does social media do for freedom of the press? If we assume that freedom of the press, that, that, that an open... Uh, and free press is a benefit to de democracy, and in the press I include electronic media as well. Um, what does social media do to our chances of uh, getting important information through a, a free press? Um, Nasma. I was going to pass it to Francesca as a journalist. Go for it. Yes, go That's for too it. obvious. <laughs> no, it's obvious, but it's better. <laughs> well, maybe we might tag team this one. Yes. But, um, yeah, in, in, in terms of freedom of the press, the, what social media has allowed uh, society to do is get a variety of information. It's not just mainstream media where people can go to, to find information. As Nesma pointed out, there are so many different platforms, there are so many different ways of getting information. Um, thinking about uh, how, people, how, how people are reaching out, um, not only to criticize media as well. This is social media has allowed people to directly um, challenge power and directly challenge how we have received information today. Yeah, and I also think that, once again, the example that I provided of people, communities being able to highlight the issues that were occurring in their areas and then it being picked up by traditional news sources. We're also knowing that journalists are shifting the ways in which they find facts, right? And in which they find stories. Um, and so I think what's happening now is, uh, you know, one thing that I didn't even know prior to, I think social media has created a space for this, is like the amount of even harassment and stifling that even journalists receive, that not necessarily on the social media platforms, but the ways in which, for example, they're trying to get a story, and you know, for the Trump administration, for example, um, the, the, the things that they face, right? And part of that is that they share it on social media. Mm. They share their stories on social media, the struggles, the, um, the issues around unionization and being able to get paid fair wages, um, all of that is being discussed through social media platforms. I think we can talk about the rise of media unions um, all across the US, and part of that is through social media platforms. People have been using that as a mechanism of connecting um, and highlighting the issues. And so I think there has been a space where it's allowed for um, journalists to share, and that, that's what I've been super grateful as, some, as someone who um, reads the news and listens to the news, to be able to understand understand kind of the ecosystem around it. Colin? Yeah, I, I, I would say <clears throat> that, that, that the press challenges power through its investigative, investigative role, doing good, hard, boring, routine, mm -hmm. uh, old-style investigative journalism. Now, it could be that social media plays a role in, in distributing that more, more widely and more efficiently and more, more quickly. But, but, you know, that's what the press should do. And I believe that social media is actually undermining that role of good <coughs> investigative journalism, which, which really has nothing to do with technology. It's got to do with, a, you know, the encouraging good standards of good ethical journalism. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, I, I, I don't think social media has got much to do with that. David, finally. In the, you know what um, empowers journalism? What makes journalism possible? Anyone want to guess? Money. Money. Where does the money come from? Advertisements. Advertisements. Anyone want to get uh, guess what per percentage of the ad market is dominated by Facebook and Google alone in the United States? Um, high 60s. The last time I saw, they're getting encroached on by Twitter. <clears throat> So to speak to Colin's point, the news media um, is in a very tricky position, mm -hmm. and they're being undermined by not social media, but social media companies and tech platforms. And we don't know what to do. So we're trying to figure it out, um, and we're doing a very bad job at figuring it out. And the government, if anyone saw the government's policy to try to start to deal with this, it was woefully inadequate. 
And so right now, the best solution we have to save journalism is for the government to save it. Now, I'm sure everyone can see the problem with that. <laughs> cannon to the left of you, cannon to the right of you, and the cannons are on fire. I don't know which to fear more, your fires or the virus that you talked about. <laughs> fear everything, Stephen. Uh, can I go on the other side now? This is getting... <laughs> so, so, so Why does this always now? happen to me? <laughs> some questions now from, uh, from our audience this evening, and thank you very much for all of them. Um, and I'll throw this out, and, and whoever is most eager to speak first can, can jump in. Uh, should for-profit private social media platforms be able to decide what is or isn't hate speech and ban users as a result? Better put, should private companies be the sole arbiters of what is or isn't offensive or hateful? Who'd like to take a crack at that one? I'm just like parsing through a bunch of like research articles right now. I'm like going through it. Um, I do not think they should be the ones to decide. There has been a lot of proposals around uh, content moderation, especially around hate speech, um, and you know, a mixture of having councils. Um, you know, there's like national councils to decide because obviously context is very specific, um, country to country, uh, even region to region. You know, what's happening in Halifax might be totally different than what's happening in Toronto, um, and so. I, I don't think that they should be the ones in control of what is deemed hate speech. I do think that there are other tactics that allow for um, residents, whatever you may call, um, people who are participating on the platforms to kind of map that out. And there's obviously like the council approach, which is one of them. Um, and there are many other approaches. There's a good book that's gonna be coming out by Sarah Roberts around content moderation that we should all read. Um, but I do not think that they should be the last, um, the last hope. I think that there are other mechanisms, but most of the time they're not willing to, to actually listen. Uh, and that's one of the harder parts, obviously. David? Uh, does anyone follow the news about uh, the, the nature of the job to be a content moderator mm -hmm. for these? I, that was just going through my head. Yeah. As, it is uh, not a nice job. Yeah. <clears throat> you're paid nothing. You're worked, overworked, you're depressed, and you're not supported because these companies don't care about their workers, certainly not at that level. And so, the, the answer is, well, if we leave it to them, they're going to protect their bottom line mm -hmm. and their public um, goodwill to the extent that's possible uh, for the, the lowest amount of money possible. YouTube has said, we can't possibly monitor everything that goes up. That's not true. Yes, they can. They don't want to spend the money. <laughs> Facebook recently said that the New Zealand uh, shooter video didn't get caught because it wasn't gruesome enough. <laughs> right? Something to the effect of, well, it didn't get flagged immediately because it wasn't awful enough. I mean, obviously, once someone found out, it was. But the point is, we don't know how to manage this stuff. Um, and then hate speech, then, of course, is a different thing because now you're into a very fine-grained distinction about what counts as what. Now, if you leave it up to a company, uh, so you don't want to, you know, getting a government to do is risky enough. If you leave it up to a company, you're either going to get, well, we're not going to do it because we can't, or you're going to get, we're going to take everything offline because we don't want to pay the fines. Right, because this is the German problem. The Germans have a model that they developed for, for hate speech. One of the things is companies are super sensitive because they don't want to get fined a billion euros. So there you go. So what do you do about it? There is no model. We haven't figured it out. And the people who are trying to figure it out at the fine grain level of, of content moderation are treated utterly and horribly, unfairly, and poorly by these companies. So uh, you know, if we're relying on these folks to do it, we're in big trouble. And yet governments don't seem to have the guts or the capacity to do it, especially in a small, small market like Canada, where tech companies will say, well, you know what? We're out. Or they'll say something like, the government will say, well, we would like you to um, keep a registry of advertising. We've got some re advertisement regulations we'd like you to have for the election, Google. And so Google says, you know what? We're just not going to do ads because you're Canada and there's 36 million people and you don't care. So our hope lies, and I'll end on a semi-hopeful note, and then I'll dash that hope. The hope lies in us coming together across the world en masse as a block to push back and to ensure something to the effect of a digital Geneva Convention. Ever seen us try to cooperate on something? <laughs>
and the Geneva Convention's on fire. <laughs> Francesca, would you like to weigh in? Um, if you look at, for example, misinformation in terms of um, anti-vax campaign, you'll see social media companies try and figure out how to deal with that. And if you type in vaccination in Pinterest, nothing comes up. And if you look at Twitter and Facebook, they've tried to take care of, of misinformation that way as well. Um, and so the question is, if we're allowing these companies to decide, yes, there needs to be a discussion about how that happens because we can't just take down all information like Pinterest did because that needs to be filled with accurate information. Um, so there needs to be discussion about how that is managed and yeah, we're not having it right now. Colin? No. No? <laughs> Continue he, said, on? he said what I wanted to say. Oh, all right. I'll move on to another question. We've got lots of questions about regulation, which is interesting. We also have a question that riffs off of the question I asked about whether it's, it's impossible to uh, engage in civil discourse in social media. Um, this, is, uh, this is to the against side, because the, this is, if yes, turn over. Um, <laughs> what strategies would you suggest to engage in destructive uh, conversation and discussion on social media? It's a good question. You, um, you have already made a very good suggestion, which is, you know, e examine, you know, greet the trolls, basically. Yeah, I think I think that it matters on obviously who you're having a conversation with. If you're about to have conversations in a comment section for a video that was you know, produced by BuzzFeed and that's, you know, like it has about 2,000 comments and you're going down that rabbit hole, that might be a little bit harder, I'd say. Um, but, you know, I think the biggest thing right now is, yeah, showing part of it is like empathy building, right? Of like kind of figuring out where people are coming from. Obviously, there's going to be a lot of points where you're not going to uh, be in that position whatsoever and you're not going to have the patience for it. But part of the reason why we ha might not have the patience is because we're all overworked and underpaid. That's probably the reason. Hmm. Um, and so I think that, you know, I think empathy is a good one. And also just like I, I notice myself personally, um, I end up actually reading a lot of like comment sections or responding to discourse actually in the morning when I'm a little bit more like fresh, I would find, uh, than in the evening when it's like when you're tired and just over all of it. And I'm like that even with human beings in real life. So, you know, I, I, I approach it the same way. So um, I'd say empathy and like maybe pick your timing like mm -hmm. you do with other humans in your life. Francesca? I um, printed out some of the comments that we have gotten on our in our comments section and instead of ignoring them like I mentioned we've we've gone in there and, and asked you know how do you know this why do you know this why do you think this um, and and in I've always been surprised always been surprised when I've entered into these conversations with a generous assumption and so for example one of the one of the responses was um, thank you for taking the time to respond I'm just tired of seeing uh, I'm just tired of seeing all this information it sounds like there's a lot more of this issue than I realized another comment was also please understand that sometimes I like to play devil's advocate when I comment so it's just about having these conversations and and um, being willing to engage in a thoughtful way um, and, and also sharing the sources of information uh, mm -hmm. so that people yeah. can check that information for themselves. Uh, not going on emotion, but going on fact. David? <laughs> Referring to you, some of the tweets you read us? <clears throat> I, uh, sometimes I, I try to take a generous attitude towards these folks. And sometimes I'm just not having it and I respond in kind. <laughs> But, but not, when you not talk. my finest moment. But I, I will say this, and I will concede this. Every so often, when you do engage with one of these people, what you find is that, as Francesca indicates, they are upset, alienated, confused, tired, whatever, lost. They want to be heard. <clears throat> they want to be listened to. Uh, the problem is, there aren't enough listeners mm -hmm. compared to the number of people who want to be listened to. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to fix that ratio on social media because it is inherently structured in such a way that makes it almost impossible under the model that these companies operate with. Mm -hmm. Because it's hard to listen 
it's hard to engage good f in good faith. That's a lot, it takes a lot of emotional labor to do that. And we're not incentivized to do that or supported. So in an ideal unicorn world, I believe we could do it. Um, but in the current, uh, situa current setup, I don't think we can. That said, in the final section of my book, <laughs> 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 I do get into some possible solutions, and I uh, highly recommend it. <laughs> that is good. It's also available at the library, um, and that's perfectly fine too. I didn't get that far. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding, I read the whole thing. Colin. Um, let, me, let me just say something from the perspective of a teacher. Um, and my completely anecdotal impression that social media is affecting the way that young people can logically think from A to B to C to D to E in constructing well-reasoned logical arguments. Now, I don't think this is just the fault of social media. Let me say that straight away. But I do think that the propensity with the current generation, which has known nothing but so social media, right, uh, to, to speak, to want to be listened to, to be used to being, to, to putting it out there, you know, da da da, every, everywhere, da is detrimental to the ability to write a 4,000 word essay uh, with a strong thesis <laughs> state at the beginning, with a series of empirical statements in the middle supported by very, very well researched sources from the library. <laughs> And a conclusion which goes back to that initial thesis statement where there's, a str where there's a research question is becoming very, very difficult to expect. And I say that because I've just been reading essays from my students today. And they're all extremely bright, extremely well engaged, extremely sympathetic young people. Uh, but I worry about it. I have a question, though. Do we need to be writing 4,000-word essays? You do. <laughs> you do. You, you do if you want to take my class on American politics, <laughs> which is a great class. It's very popular. It's got 60 <laughs> undergraduates. They all come in there. They're really, they're really enthused about it. Some of them are actually writing about social media. Some of them are reading, writing about the filter bubbles, the false information, Russian trolling, all that. And they've done great research, but they can't string it together. And so what I'd end up doing is giving, you know, A grades to papers that 20 years ago I would have given a B minus to. And but my colleagues you. in other parts of academia e express similar uh, frustrations. Have you ever, frustrating. Have you ever not given a grade and just written LOL at the end? <laughs> That is, that, that will be contrary to UVic's anti-harassment policy, I think. Actually, I would say something, though, that I remember in university, we used to use Facebook groups, and that's actually how we survived. Oh, I got a story about that as well. <laughs> yes, I, tell I us. Actually, I actually teach a course called The Politics of Surveillance. And I get my students to write lovely case studies on um, uh, um, different forms of information collection in the public sector. And they do lots and lots of great, great research, and it's, it's a lot of fun. But we have a, a, a platform <coughs> at, at our university called Course Spaces, and we have to use that because the personal data is actually held in Canada rather than overseas. And I was wondering why they weren't using this for the group function, and I realized that they were all using their Facebook groups in order to talk to each other about their paper projects. <laughs> And I thought, well, now, wait a minute, that's defeating the purpose here. Um, and so, um, you know, there's no escaping Facebook, even though I, uh, you know, as I said at the beginning, I'm on it. And, uh, really quick, I'm not on it. Quickly on that note, if you go to rateMyProfessors.com, oh, yeah, yes. you will, uh, <clears throat> speaking of cesspools, I, it's, a, it's effectively a social media site for rating your professors. You will find an absolutely scurrilous and scathing review of me. Yes, me too. Uh, utterly unreadable um, for a class that I never taught. Mm. 
Well, oh, I really phoned it in having never taught it and absolutely deserve that. Also, I, I got no chili peppers. And, and I can see I, some of you know what that means, and I thank yeah, yeah. you for your sympathy. I, I, some are working it out from context. And that concludes one of, one of the com round two of our debate. Just I wish quick, I had a bell. Quick. And thank you to our audience for all of those questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them. Uh, they're all very good questions. And thank you uh, to our panel, to our debaters, for their very thoughtful uh, answers. Uh, on to round three now. And um, this will be uh, a closing argument. Uh, you each have two minutes, two minutes to give us a closing argument. And uh, since uh, Nasma went last in round one, uh, you may begin round three with your closing argument against the resolution, is social media destroying democracy? Social media has created a space uh, for me to connect with friends, uh, connect with loved ones. Um, I'm currently stuck on a family group chat on WhatsApp that I can never leave. And it has brought me closer to people from all over the world. And even though I understand in many cases that I am in filter bubbles and get the same news uh, quite often, uh, it has played a role in, in, in creating processes for us to engage, to speak out, to participate, to show our support uh, for our loved ones, for our community, for our country. Um, it highlights the inequities that exist um, in our physical spaces. It's created places for folks to find uh, affordable rent, uh, to, you know, us stealing answers for homework. So it's played a, all, all the things. And I think it's important to know that social media plays a positive role in what brought us here today. We're on YouTube live, are we not? Right, I think it's part of what we are right now. So shout out to the folks on YouTube, hello. Um, so I, uh, even though we are currently dealing with the growing pains of social media and its impact on our lives, I think it's important to recognize that it is a tool that we use. Um, and it is a tool that we use that brings us into a space like this. And um, you know, social media is not actually the culprit of all of our issues. It is not the absolute target of all the madness that exists in our anger. Um, but I do think that we have to have larger conversations around power and inequality and wealth concentration in this country that goes beyond the social media conversation. And we have to have those uncomfortable conversations. And some of that's going to happen on Twitter.com. And I think that's part of what we're going to have to experience uh, moving forward. And I hope that there is going to be a point where we are regulating these platforms and that we are creating more democratic processes on these platforms, uh, not just the big ones, but also the small. So thank you so much for participating in this. Thank you, Nasma. Uh, Colin, your closing argument for, you have two minutes. Thank you. It, just on the rate my professor issue, um, if you go in there and look at me, you'll see one of my students describe me as pretentious um, and spelt pretentious incorrectly. So, <clears throat> Should I take this person seriously? I, I, I want to make two, I just want to give two examples, uh, which I think reinforce the points that David and I are making. Um, it's all very well to think that uh, um, you know, the, the surveillance underlying social media is, is, is not, not troubling when it's a human, harmless consumer product that we may, may freely ignore. But the, the thing is that, that it's now used in, for micro-targeting ads in political campaigns. In the 2016 election, uh, the Facebook campaign, uh, uh, there were fa Facebook dark posts against Hillary Clinton, um, which was quoting a, 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 her saying something about African Americans back in the 1990s. And this was uh, um, uh, sent to African American voters in particularly those Midwestern cities that uh, uh, ended up voting for Trump, Philadelphia, Cleveland, and so on and so forth. The African American vote was depressed in those cities. And, you know, we, we can look at sort of larger structural reasons why uh, Trump was elected. But, you know, there's a pretty good explanation there, in my view. Uh, I, I think when, uh, without that kind of vote suppression tactics, uh, we probably wouldn't have President Trump right now. And then what did happen with the, the Arab Spring? What did happen with the so-called 
called Twitter revolution, the Facebook revolution, the social media revolution. Well, what happened was that authoritarian regimes got very, very good at using social media themselves to their advantage. Troll forms feeding hundreds of fake media, media accounts and bots. To, uh, intimidation through spyware. We haven't talked about spyware that much either. Hacking, abusive comments, and so on. So think about the structure of power that underpins social media. It looks nice and glossy and democratic and engaging on the surface, but look down at the structure of power that's un un underlying it. I think that's really what this debate's about and why it's fundamentally anti-democratic. Colin, thank you. <laughs> Francesca, your closing argument against the resolution? Uh, we want to close by revisiting the, the, the resolution that proposes that this, our system of government is being destroyed, is ceasing to exist because of a tool that all of us here in the room have the power to control. The algorithms that figure out what kind of information you're being shown are controlled by clicks, and those clicks are controlled by all of us. Social media is doing what it was designed to do. It isn't inherently democratic. It isn't inherently undemocratic. But we can choose how to harness that tool in ways that help us participate in this democracy, in ways that spread ideas, in ways that allow us to express freedom of speech, freedom of opinion, freedom of belief, and even in ways that threaten all the systems that we have in place. And we're doing that. We've seen social media used as a tool that allows underrepresented people to be heard and start meaningful political movements, like Me Too, Black Lives Matter, Take a Knee. So in closing, we're asking, vote for the idea that all of us in this room have the agency to choose how to use social media. Thank you, Francesca. And finally, David Moskrop, you have two minutes to give your closing argument in favor of the resolution. Well, thank you to you, Stephen, uh, to the opposing side, to the organizers. Um, to Colin and, and to all of you for being a part of this. Um, and I look forward to the YouTube comments. Now, uh, social media uh, is killing democracy. Democracy is inherently fragile. It always has been. A Pew study from a few years ago found that uh, surveying folks, about 20-some percent were okay with autocracy, about a similar number were okay with military rule. A full 50% were okay with technocracy over democracy, ruled by experts. People want results. They care more about results than process in many cases, and they're willing to throw the process out the window if they can get results. The problem is, of course, you become ensnared in a trap because once the process is gone, there go the results. So democracy is inherently fragile. It's already in recession here at home and abroad. And on top of all of that, you've got the rise of the alt-right, the authoritarian populists, authoritarian regimes around the world, the looming specter of climate change, which will test our institutions like they've never been tested before. And that's the environment in which social media has served as an opportunistic infection through which nefarious actors are now killing off democracy by undermining our elections, our political decisions, and our civic discourse. So no, Social democracy isn't inherently destructive towards democracy, but it's killing democracy because it is the infection that may finally do us in, I'm sad to say. Thank you, David. And that concludes our closing arguments, which means it is now time for you to once again vote. And remember that the winner of tonight's debate is the team that has changed the most minds here tonight. So we'll be looking at the difference between the two votes. Please cast your vote for the resolution, against the resolution, or let us know that you are still undecided after everything we've heard here this evening. Uh, rip the corresponding ticket, pass it to the end of your row for collection by our volunteers. Do you follow your gut the entire time? And while we are, while you are all voting, I would like to just can just uh, continue the discussion a little bit as a form of entertainment <laughs> while you're we can also dance if making you like. your decisions <laughs> yeah. uh, the debate portion is finished none of this will have any bearing on your vote um, here's what I'm curious about um, I'm curious about the degree and again this is very self-serving and forgive me 
I am, um, and Francesca, I'd love to hear what you think about this because you work for a small independent media organization. I work for the Mother Corp. Um, <laughs> to what degree is social media driving what we are seeing in broadcast media? I, I mean, I, I think that it has a huge role in what we're seeing, but um, it, I, I think that it, it, in terms of where we work, it's also been a really uh, amazing tool to address a lot of misinformation. Uh, for example, we did a story that was looking at housing on uh, First Nation reserves, and people in the comments thread were, were saying a lot of things that were just blatantly wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we decided to do was we looked at those comments and we thought we'd make a YouTube video that directly addressed the things that we were seeing. And um, we saw huge engagement in that video and not only that, but we also published a story that involved the methodology behind that and where the facts were. And people really engaged with that too. So I think in terms of forcing media to be more transparent about where information is coming and how we're sharing that information, it's, it's been a huge tool. I, I'm not talking about the, the lofty mission of, of the broadcast media to you know, foster democracy and civil discourse. I'm talking about the news editor who uh, sees uh, a terrible car crash uh, before they go to sleep that night and comes in in the morning and said, hey, do we have that, that car crash? Do we, are, are we making time for that? Because everybody needs to see that car crash. Well, so one of the ways that we've, we are um, choosing or, or, or choosing which stories to cover is actually we're putting things to a vote on Facebook and we're putting things to a vote um, on our website and uh, how we gather the information for which stories to put to a vote is that we've been doing in-depth interviews with, with the community and we'll, we'll gather all that information and we've put it online and, and we're actually using it as a tool to, to find out what communities really want to hear about uh, in terms of what they want a journalist to cover. And, and is this uh, community engagement, does it occur online or do you bring actual breathing humans into a room and talk to them? We, we do both, but a lot of it does happen online in terms of, of the vote. But when we are gathering the information about what issues to cover, those are in-person interviews. Uh, David, you've got uh, a fair amount of broadcast experience and you watch the media very closely. Um, what do you think about the impact of social media on the broader, let's call it the traditional media? <laughs> I recently accidentally bought $54 worth of cheese. <laughs> Out of social did, embarrassment. Did, did you post that anywhere? So I did. So I have a low threshold for social embarrassment. So I accidentally bought cheese that was $100 a kilo and couldn't, didn't, couldn't say no because they'd already packaged it. And so I got home and I tweeted about it and uh, I got a call from a producer. <laughs> Do you want to come on the show to talk about your cheese? <laughs> and uh, so I said, yeah, sure, why not? That's funny. And, uh, you know, when you're promoting a book, you say yes to everything. <laughs> and, and so I went on and talked about cheese. Now, I'm a, a political theorist. I'm, you know, I used it as an opportunity to pivot to having a discussion about how um, privileged it is. And I, I truly mean this. It is to be able to walk out of a grocery store with $54 worth of cheese you don't want. <laughs> You know, I grew up in Peterborough with uh, uh, nothing, you know, single mother, that whole story. And we would, you know, I remember as a kid, we'd get to the grocery store, you know, you get up to the cash register and you can see my mom, you know, counting in her head how much stuff's going to cost as it starts getting rung through because, you know, do you have the, the cash for it? And so, uh, and then, you know, sometimes you've got to put things back. And it's, it's deeply embarrassing, but also, I mean, it's deeply, um, I think, um, a scathing review of the sort of society in which we live. But the point being is I used a silly moment to pivot to an important political moment. Uh, the part, a bigger problem with social media and influencing broadcast is it is a sort of democratization, quote unquote, of the news, but not in the good way. Now, if we had a bunch of discourses all over the place, of what, you know, if we had a lot of what Francesca was doing, I'd feel a lot better about this because that's fantastic and I, I, you know, I, 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 I have nothing but wonderful things to say about that and thank you for doing it. But broadly speaking, profit-driven entities are, want to make money, they want to get clicks. So they're going to chase the silly clickbait nonsense. And so there has been sort of clickbaitification mm -hmm. of broadcast news, despite the fact that there's good, smart folks. The number of broadcast people, here's a little trade secret, that would say to me like, oh, we got to cover this thing. 
it's, it's through the roof. And so that concerns me a great deal. And, and I think as, as media gets more competitive and as the space shrinks and as they chase few, you know, ad dollars, it's only going to get worse. Um, I, I myself am, am no longer able to thwart the, uh, the Globe and Mail's paywall. Um, <laughs> sadly. Jesus. Gave up that a year ago. Um, but are we... And, and this is slightly off topic for the democratic discussion, but I hope it's useful. Are, are we um, entering into an age of the news for uh, people who can pay and people who can't? Do we have rich people's news and poor people's news? Um, the rich people subscribe to the Globe and Mail and the Washington Post and the New York Times and a bunch of other uh, quality publications, and everyone else gets misinformation through Facebook and Twitter. I'll say really quickly though, just, I mean, I don't want, I want, I want, I, 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 as a rule, it's nice to hear other people speaking on me, but I'll say this. It, it was ever thus though, right? I mean, because it was always that people had to pay for news. Mm -hmm. And I, and I want to do say this. There was no Gilded Age. A hundred years ago, Pulitzer, who was a real piece of work, I don't know how he got a prize named after him. I'm never going to get one so I can say this. Pulitzer and William and Hearst basically started a war because they wanted to sell newspapers, the Spanish American mm -hmm. War talk about it in the book. Uh, so there was no golden age. But this speaks to what Nasma was saying, which I think was such an important point. It's like there are deep inequities, so I'm curious what you have to say about that. Yeah, I think that it's, it's essentially the assumption that you're making there is that everything on Facebook is then misinformation, which is not the case. There's actually a lot of really amazing folks who do try their best to share like the most you know, accurate information, but we also are having a rise of pundits on the left and the right that are sh sharing misinformation, right? And that's been, you know, a good example of that is Sean King, which he might sue me, but Sean King on Twitter and Facebook. I think very specific people will know that. Um, it's a very specific reference. But um, I think that it's, yeah, I don't think that the news has always been accessible, so I think that's one thing um, to always understand. I personally have tried my best to support a certain uh, certain mm -hmm. journalists and we're seeing that also with the rise of like the Patreons and the Kickstarters and the GoFundMes and the, all of that stuff if, uh, because of the ways in which uh, the media system is also shifting um, you know consumers are paying more to access um, and we get to decide I guess what we want to access discourse is one of the amazing platforms and so I think for me I am trying to support as much as I possibly can, uh, but I think that it, it's not inherent, it was never inherently like democratic to begin with and like it wasn't always free. And so I think that this is just a growing pain time right now. All right, Francesca? And I think too, if we look at the idea of audience funded journalism, I think that's another way to ensure that um, the process is more democratic and instead of advertisers. Um, and so getting people to pay for the journalism that they want to see, that's one way to vote for what kind of information information should be out there. And what about funding specific projects, accepting funding uh, that we're always told no, you know, has no strings attached to it, and, uh, but underwriting? Um, you look at the NPR model, for instance, which is widely listener supported, um, but you have underwriters funding specific investigations. Um, what does uh, the discourse think about that? Speaking for your publication. <laughs> On the record. I mean, I, think I speak for myself, but <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll say, I mean, regardless of um, where money comes from, it's important that journalists maintain that an editorial process is independent from where that money comes from. Um, yeah, and I think that's been harder, though, even as a consumer, as someone who actually mm -hmm. reads the news all the time and also watches a lot of YouTube videos, you could see that there's even sly ways that people are making sponsored content, right? These are news medias that are making sponsored content. You won't know that until you see the comments and everyone's like, I think that was a sponsored video and it's not clear. And so I think that, you know what, we recognize that, the you know, the, what's happening with the media ecosystem, just be honest about what's happening, right? Like, just be honest, it's an ad or be clear, don't mm -hmm. make it small font, you know, just state that it's an ad. Colin, anything to add there? Um, yeah, I, I, I have a load to add, I guess, but um, the, the um, it, it's, it's, it always has been this way, I think. I don't think that social media is really affecting 
the relationship, there's been good good journalism and bad journalism, and the, the the issues concerning who funds journalists and, and whether it's advertising, etc., has always been has always been there. I, I'd like to get to a point, however, where traditional media decide that, boy, let's just not cover Trump's tweets. <laughs> let's just let's just let's just collectively decide that they are incredibly boring and uninteresting and don't do anything for democratic discourse is that can we conceive of a point in the future when that might happen that would be the question i would add we have the preliminary results thank you colin we have the preliminary results of the vote just to remind you where you were when you walked in here this evening um, after and, and how far you've come after being convinced by our esteemed panel. Uh, against the resolution, when you walked in, 20% were opposed to the resolution. 50% uh, were in favor of the resolution. 30% of you were undecided. Uh, as we stand now, uh, for the resolution is now 40%. Against the resolution, I'm, I'm sorry, pardon me, for the resolution is 47%. Pardon me, I'm sorry. So it's for the resolution, 47%. Against the resolution, 40%. Yeah. And what we have uh, done is got a whole lot of undecided people to decide something because it's at 13%. So congratulations to our panel. for changing some minds this evening. Um, and, uh, and congratulations to our winner as well. I would now like to invite uh, Nancy Olweiler, Director and Professor of Simon Fraser University School of Public Policy to the stage to say a few closing words. Nancy. You can stay here, don't go, don't go. Don't go, Stephen, you can stay in case we have another question that people have to answer. Uh, thank you, uh, our panel. Nazma, Colin, uh, Dave, and uh, Francesca. Another big hand for them. Aren't they fantastic? <laughs> and, uh, you know, they've shown that what people, with, with civil discourse, we get informed opinions, we get uh, humor. We're all going to light our hair on fire tonight, I think, if, uh, if, if David has to buy more cheese. Uh, but uh, thank you all. It's, it's been fantastic. Stephen, thank you. Uh, don't you have to get up at like in a couple of hours? Oh, I was feeling so badly for him because, you know, he has to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning. But I took tomorrow off. He took tomorrow off. So <laughs> thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Stephen. And thank you to Public Square and uh, the BCE Civil Discourse. We have shown yet again that discourse is possible in this age and that free thinking people can come out. Thank you so much for doing that. And I'd like to give a special thanks to two of our students, MPP students, Kat Gallant and Sarah Carthy. Would you just stand up? They did a bunch of research for this. Thank you. In the middle of exams and writing those long papers, which public policy students do with evidence. <laughs> Thank you all for coming out. It's great to see you. Thank you so much for supporting these kind of activities at Simon Fraser University. Thank you, and go out and make the against side win, that we can have social media yeah. without the struggle.